Hello. So this talk is going to stand out a little bit, I think, because unlike most of the previous talks that you heard uh, that were about strings in EDS spacetime, this is going to be about strings that naturally live uh, just in flat Minkowski space, uh, like confining strings or flux tubes of QCD. And uh, the, just the big question that at some point we, uh, we asked ourselves is uh, can such a flux tube uh, be integrable? For example, uh, some natural candidate would be confining flux tube but infinite n QCD. Uh, or maybe now we understand that the, the, the better question is how integrable can it be? Uh, and so I will try to explain what, uh, what we understand about this question now. Uh, that's uh, um, in broad strokes the summary of my talk. Um, and turns out that, that it's convenient to organize your thinking about this problem in terms of energy expansion, going from low energies to high energies. Uh, and it turns out that at, at low energies in the infrared, all confining flux tubes and Lorentz invariant theories are integrable. Okay, and that's something that, uh, that Raphael uh, talked about on this conference two years ago, and that's something mostly about the Sergey talked on the previous uh, conference. So I will summarize it. Uh, briefly, of course, but not without too many details, which means that if it gets confusing, you should uh, interrupt and ask me. I think it's okay when, during the talk. Um, when we go a little bit higher in energies, basically at energies of order lambda QCD, which is the, uh, the only length scale in, in the problem, at least in the simplest cases, uh, there is an abstraction to integrability. There is universally integrability breaks down. Uh, and it turns out that it can be fixed only if you add some extra massless particles that should be propagating on the world ship. Okay? Uh, and and that, that's something that I'm going to talk about mostly uh, today. Uh, however, what, what happens just from, from lattice data where we can extract some information about the spectrum of the particles living on the, on the flux tube, uh, we only see some massive extra modes. Uh, so, so it means that I think now we're pretty sure that just like Q QCD flux tube at infinite n cannot be an integrable theory. Okay, uh, however, in, in, the, in the end of my talk, uh, I want to uh, kind of speculate a little bit, so it's, go, it's going to be less, less robust than, uh, the, the, than the previous two parts, that maybe if you go to even higher energies, if you go some deep in the ultraviolet, maybe the theory wants to become integrable again, okay? And, 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 and maybe we have some hints uh, for this happening again from the lattice or from some general intuition, okay? Okay, so, so, so what is the, uh, the QCD flux tubes? So, so the good thing about QCD flux tubes is that they exist, okay, which makes them more exciting to study. Uh, namely, if, if I take two quarks, uh, quark and anti-quark, I even managed to draw an anti-quark. Uh, if, you, if you take them apart, uh, there will be a flux tube stretched in between them, okay? This, they may not be very long-lived, but they actually do get produced in some <laughs> experiments in, uh, at LHC, okay? Uh, and if I take this, the length of the flux tubes to infinity, then this becomes just some two-dimensional Lorentz invariant, uh, relativistic from the two-dimensional point of view, a relativistic two-dimensional theory in the infinite volume, so I can study its S metrics, okay? Uh, and, and of course, in real QCD, the, it, it will start breaking up if I, if I really take them uh, far apart. 
uh, but one can consider some simplified situation uh, like it, when n goes to infinity then uh, then this breaking will be suppressed uh, also if you don't have any light quarks that at low energies even at finite n uh, this uh, the slug silk will be stable uh, so so, so basically the, the, the outcome is that it's the simplest thing to keep in mind is some n to infinity limit where it becomes stable. But, but what I'm going to talk about in the first part of my talk at low energies, the n to infinity limit, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that relevant. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I want to think about this long, so from now on I'm basically talking about this infinitely long flux you going along the whole space time. Uh, and the way I think about it is just like a vacuum sector of the theory which spontaneously break translation invariance due to the presence of this flux that sits at some fixed position. Okay, and it means that, that I have uh, this uh, d minus two Goldstone bosons which are just transverse excitations of the string. Okay, Th these are the usual embedding coordinates of the string that you always have for any sigma model. Uh, just for me it's really convenient to think about them as Goldstone bosons. Uh, that, uh, that, that realize this pattern of symmetry breaking. So this ISO, that's uh, uh, just Poincaré group. This is my notation for the Poincaré group uh, in, uh, in d-dimensional bulk. Uh, and it gets broken down to the just two-dimensional Lorentz invariants uh, and, uh, and uh, rotations, orthogonal rotations around the string. So again, I, I will stress that uh, unlike for most uh, strings in, in ADS where your world sheet theory, you, you don't really have an embedding which preserves 2D Lorentz invariants. Here everything will be definitely Lorentz invariant from the two-dimensional point of view. Okay. What's, so, so since these guys are goldstones, they nonlinearly realize this, uh, the rest of the symmetries. Uh, in particular, they realize the shifts. Uh, that's, that's easy. Importantly, they also nonlinearly realize the, the remaining boosts in this alpha i plane. So, so i, that's always directions orthogonal to the string, and, and alpha, beta, these are directions on the world sheet. So, so that's just the transformation law. I mean, you can see you just rotate, you shift x by, by sigma, basically. That's, that's, that means that you're, you're tilting your string in the orthogonal plane. Okay. And I, I can just write perturbatively just effective actions, like a, just like a chiral Lagrangian for pions, basically, this thing. So I start with the kinetic term, and because I have this nonlinear transformation, generate some, uh, some interactions. So these are the leading interactions. Uh, and these coefficients, they're just fixed, you know, in order for the thing to, to satisfy this, this nonlinear, to, to be invariant under this nonlinear transformation that I had. So in this order, every, everything is fixed. Okay, and, and this, so this, the coupling constant, kind of analog of f pi for pi ions, uh, that's like a string length, which should be like a four lambda QCD for QCD, and uh, it's also related to the string tension. Okay, and, and I, I can just start and, and compute perturbative. So it's an infinitely long string. So, so when I talk about integrability, I really mean just integrability of an S matrix of scattering of those X's and whatever other particles that may or may not live on this world sheet. Uh, and this, uh, the, the scattering of, of the kinematics and analytic properties of scattering uh, of massless relativistic particles, it was very nicely reviewed by, uh, by Alessandra a couple of days ago, so I will skip that part. Uh, I will only say that because I have this uh, OD minus two invariants, uh, there are three possible channels. There are these annihilations, uh, transmissions, uh, and reflections, depending on how the flavor of particles gets exchanged. And these three functions are just analytic functions of the center of mass energy variable S, just the product of left moving and right moving momenta. Or you can, I mean, we, we usually use the just momenta, but you can rewrite it in terms of rapidities in this way, if you're more used to that. And, 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 and the only S matrix that exists here is the left-right S matrix, okay? There is no, I, I want to say, there is no left-left or no right-right S matrix. I mean, there are a few ways to see it, but basically because there are no infrared divergences in this theory. So, so when you go to low energies, I mean, this, there is nothing in the left-left, right-right sector. Okay, so I can just sit down. Uh, 
Ah, okay. That's that, that's a comment that 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 in this approach. Um, I'm working directly with physical degrees of freedom. There are no constraints. Uh, uh, whatever I calculate, uh, I get the physical answer already. Uh, you can do a different thing. You can reintroduce conformal invariants, uh, do something you know more, maybe something that you are more used to, and then these leading interactions they will come from solving for the Verasora constraint. Uh, but it's. Uh, the result that you get is completely, uh, completely the same. Of course, if you calculate some gauge invariant observable, no matter how you calculate, as long as you calculate correctly, you get the same thing. Okay. Anyway, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, this thing got skipped. Okay. Uh, so I can just take this Lagrangian and uh, and, st and, and 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 start calculating perturbatively. Uh, and what I get, oops, uh, just at the tree level, just from these two quartic vertices, I get that A and C vanish, and B is equal to something. B is equal to uh, Ls squared over 4 times S. Okay? And in principle, I could have done it, you know, I, I, I could go on. Uh, but there is a smarter way to, to calculate things. Uh, and, and maybe just conceptually better way to think about this, this whole model directly in terms of an S matrix. So I want to see how the, uh, my nonlinear symmetries, how they realize directly at the level of the S matrix. Uh, and, and then we know how, I mean, from pion Lagrangian, if you have some broken current, its word identities will give soft theorems, okay, that S matrix are satisfied. So let me let me review for you really quick how the just basically a standard derivation of uh, of soft theorems for broken currents. Okay, so I started with my shift current that has a piece that just linear in field. Okay, and then it has some some other piece that I I I don't really care uh, what it is uh, for now, but it uh, it starts with some higher power of fields. Okay, and I, I sandwich it between some in and out state, and I know that that's zero because the current is conserved. Okay, so now I just s separate these two pieces, uh, and the part that's linear in fields that gi basically gives me an LSD formula because there is a p squared. Okay, once I once I Fourier transform these two derivatives, and the piece that's nonlinear in field that gives something. And the sum is zero. So now, if I go to, if I take the soft limit, if I take the limit p going to zero, what happens is, on the, on the left, this thing goes into an S matrix element with an additional particle, okay? And the right hand side should not develop any singularity when p, p goes to zero, but there is an explicit factor of p, so it, it should go to zero, so it should be like O of p. So that's the soft theorem. That's why I expect the S matrix to be soft. Okay, so that's a standard thing. Let's let's do the same trick for uh, for the for the Lorentz boost. So what I know about the Lorentz boost uh, is that it starts with uh, with shifting by a coordinate, right? Because that's a that's a boost. So there is a piece of the current that explicitly depends on the coordinate, and then there is some whatever other stuff that I denote by k. So now conservation of the boost current. If you see, it tells me that the shift current is itself a total derivative. It's a derivative of some other current. Well, in this, in this case, not of a current. It's derivative of some other operator. It's k. So now I do the same thing. I again use the conservation of my shift current. And this part doesn't really change. It's still the, basically the, the LSD formula that got materialized here. But now I have two powers of momentum that I can pull out. And again, this k is some thing that's nonlinear in fields. So as long as this thing is not singular, okay, I would expect the double softness of my amplitudes. I would expect amplitudes to go to zero as p squared with some of the momenta is taken to zero. However, especially in two dimensions, we should be, we should be very careful when we're taking soft limits, right? In fact, uh, this, this piece, this, this little k, 
uh, it has, uh, just if you look at it perturbatively, uh, it has the part that's, that has my x without any derivatives. Okay, so that's very dangerous. You have like a massless field in two dimension uh, that is not acted upon by a derivative. So that could lead to some IR singularities. Uh, so I need to, to dig in and, and to see what, what kind of IR singularities can appear here. And well, you can prove essentially or argue that there are only two of them, okay, that are, that are depicted on these beautiful drawings, uh, these Feynman diagrams, okay? So, so what, what's happened here is that I'm looking for the divergent pieces in the soft limit uh, that are present inside of this thing K. And, and I say that there are only two things that can appear. There is, there is so that's, that's the P, this little P, uh, sorry, P plus, that's, that's the momentum that I'm going to take into zero. I took it, say, right mover for concreteness. Uh, and there can, can be a three level pole that appears, and there can be a one, one loop. Uh, it's something like, called like Coleman Thun singularities that uh, they were very well studied in, like, in Sign Gordon models and, and similar ones. Uh, and those singularities, they take the rest of the Feynman diagram on shell. So what happens is that, in fact, soft theorems, they are even more interesting in this case. They don't just tell you that some S matrix element vanishes when you, when you take the momentum to zero. It actually relates a Feynman diagram with n legs to, sorry, not Feynman diagram, it relates to your physical amplitude with n legs to the amplitude with n minus two legs, okay? And so th this, this also has n legs. So there's some, some equation that, re that relates uh, two different uh, matrix elements, okay? Two different amplitudes. So, Using this formula, you can uh, pretty quickly convince yourself that at three level, the S matrix is integrable, okay? So the scattering, at the three level, the whole scattering factorizes. Okay, that's not the, that's not the easiest way to, uh, to prove it, uh, we, uh, but, it, but it is a, it's more like a sanity check uh, of, this, uh, of this word identity that the three level scattering uh, in this series, integrable. Okay. Uh, huh? So now I, I want to go to one loop, and uh, the soft theorems they don't immediately tell me anything about uh, one loop two to two amplitude, but that's something that is uh, that is easy to calculate. And so when I calculate it, uh, I get that at one loop I get annihilations and reflections that are proportional to d minus 26, okay? So that's, that's kind of how you, how you see the critical dimension uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this approach. So I just started with some uh, string that, I mean, QCD string obviously exists in any number of dimension. I mean, why would, say, imaginary QCD be special in 26 dimension? Well, because there will be cancellation of this piece. So this on its own doesn't, really tell anything about integrability. Curiously enough, uh, you can, uh, well, you can solve Young-Baxter equations with this annihilation piece uh, only in, when d is equal to 4. So when d is larger than 4, there are no solutions of Young-Baxter. So you can immediately say that your thing is non-integrable. So in four dimensions, at this level, you can, you can still be. However, once you use this, the soft theorems, you see that these annihilations, they meet it because I relate, I, I, uh, my soft theorems, they relate at the six particle amplitude to four particle amplitude. So I see that the four particle amplitude has annihilations, then there is a non-vanishing two to four process, okay? So this way I completely just, just at the level of symmetries, I've proven uh, that if I have uh, this theory of uh, massless uh, if, 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 if my infrared theory doesn't have any extra massless particles, then just from uh, word identities for my Lorentz, four-dimensional Lorentz symmetry, I show that there is a non-integrable piece in the amplitude. Okay? Uh, and, uh, well, one, 
uh, so that, that's the statement in four dimensions. So in three dimensions, this uh, uh, this uh, A and C they uh, uh, they actually vanish. So in three dimensions, you can in principle uh, you can in principle be uh, be integrable. But anyway, four, four, four dimensions is the main focus of this talk. Uh, and so the point here that we, we have this universal result, you can maybe treat it as a negative result. Uh, however, uh, this uh, non-integrability, it only kicks in like at the level of one loop, six point amplitude, so approximate integrability is still useful and we can apply thermodynamic beta on that to, to, cal to calculate the spectrum. And, uh, uh, so, so this is good. Anyway, uh, today I'm going to, uh, to, to tell you that if, if I add some new massless particles on the world ship, okay, can they, can they restore the integrability somehow? Can they cancel this non-integrable piece on the amplitude? Uh, and the answer is yes, you can. Uh, moreover, we get a family, a discrete family of integrable theories that are labeled by quantum numbers of these new particles that I'm, that I'm going to be adding. Uh, and moreover, my soft theorems that I showed you, they fix completely this integrable S matrix. Okay? So they're going to talk. When did I start, by the way? Okay, good. Uh, so the, the idea is that, so that was the loop. So, so first I want, I want to cancel this, I want to cancel this annihilation piece in the 2 to 2 amplitude, okay? Uh, so that's the, the solid lines, this, so the, the goldstones like size, so that's the diagram that I had before. So what I'm adding, oops, I'm adding the loop of this, uh, the new particle, the, the dashed line, and, and this new particle can possibly have some cubic interactions, okay, with the goldstone. And I want the sum of these things to be zero, okay? Uh, so one example of this is that I can add a scalar particle. So I made into whatever action I showed you before, I add a scalar particle. So the induced metric, that's just the metric uh, the, again, there is no separate field as a metric in this approach. It's just a metric. It's just made out of my goldstones. Still, I can construct a uh, curvature scalar out of this thing and couple my scalar to it. So the leading orbit will have a cubic diagram, cubic vertex with uh, four derivatives. So by derivative counting, this three-level diagram is the same as those one-loop diagrams. So for some choice of, of the coupling constant, they will cancel out, okay? And, and the, the coupling constant is the square root of 25 minus d over 48 pi that you can remember is, at least in some normalization, is a background charge for the linear Dilaton theory, okay? So what I reproduced for you is just maybe not the easiest possible language, uh, the linear Dilaton theory, okay? Uh, however, this is, not, this is not the only option, okay? I can also couple an anti-symmetric form field. I, I mean, this, this, this classification is going with respect to OD minus 2 with, my, with respect to my unbroken group. So in general, I can have an, uh, an anti-symmetric form and I have the uh, symmetric traceless tensor. Uh, and they, I have corresponding geometrical invariants constructed out of extrinsic curvature of the world sheet that turned out to be topological. Those, these two expressions are uh, total derivatives, so it's consistent to keep the, to couple a massless field to them, right? The shift invariants uh, will not get broken. And again, for some values of this coupling constant, they will cancel my, uh, my leading, at least my leading non-integral non piece in the amplitude. Uh, and uh, the, the general formula, if you want, is something like this. Uh, so I, I can add arbitrary number of, of scalars uh, f and my symmetric and anti-symmetric forms. Uh, somehow the curious thing is that the symmetric tensor it contributes here with an, with an opposite sign than the other guys. So in principle, I can construct this integrable 
non-critical string theories if you want, uh, in dimensions larger than 26. Uh, which for, for, for linear dilaton, you need to take coupling imaginary, so it's something a bit confusing. But here, I would just with real with real couplings, I can I can go uh, to arbitrary d. Okay. Uh, so now let's 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 assume that I put a correct correct number of particles with correct couplings. So I canceled my uh, annihilations for the two to two process. Uh, the question, okay, can, uh, can, I, can I say anything, you know, about, uh, about high orders? Uh, in particular, can the whole S matrix be integrable? And to do this, uh, well, it, there is at least a necessary condition that my two to four, the, the two to four processes might cancel out. So what I'm gonna, I gonna show now is that uh, uh, just this necessary condition of canceling out of two to four processes uh, to, to all loop order, it, it fixes uniquely the, uh, the S matrix if we assume that the S matrix is integrable. Uh, and again, that's, that's, that's just my, my same equation. So if the two to four S matrix is zero, also the soft part of it should be zero, okay? So, uh, well, yeah, first of all, as I said before, the, uh, uh, the thing that was true at one loop is, is true to all of us. So you, you, the S matrix has to be diagonal in the, in the flavor basis. So it's only, only B on the, only the transmission part uh, that is left. Okay. Uh, and when I look at this sum of these two diagrams, uh, as I said before, so, so, so what appears here roughly, so there is this, uh, expectation value of uh, my uh, infrared diversion part of my current that it turns out, I mean, you can show that it's only the leading three level piece that matters. Then there is a four particle amplitude and that should be equal to the same thing uh, somehow contracted with the six particle amplitude, but under assumption of integrability, the six particle amplitude is a product of two four particle amplitudes, okay? And, and then, okay, this is, this is the careful formula with all factors of I and, uh, and you know, propagators uh, that, you, that you don't have to read. Uh, but after you, after you massage it, you get a very simple equation for B. You basically get an equation that B uh, with the you know, momentum that sum of two particles is equal to the product of two Bs. And, and that thing, of course, has the unique solution, which is which is simply an exponent, okay? Uh, and I, I think that that's something pretty cute uh, because uh, we managed to bootstrap our S matrix just from the, from the condition that it has to uh, realize uh, some nonlinear symmetries, right? So th th they're, not, they're not symmetries that act very nicely on the Hilbert space, right? They, they produce some stuff out of the vacuum. But they do act uh, nicely on the S matrix, and turns out that n does option of integrability, they, they, they fix it uniquely. Well, they fix it up to a constant, then the constant can be fixed from our three level calculation. So they only allow two to two S matrix uh, is this e to the is thing. Okay? And, well, you shouldn't be too surprised because for, 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 for if you heard any of our previous talks about fundamental strings, that's just the S matrix that appears uh, in the row sheet scattering of fundamental strings in, in critical dimension. Uh, so some, some new piece of information is that this, again, if you look at this word identities with different uh, uh, external legs of my new particles that I introduced, they all have to scatter with the same, with the same phase shift. Okay, so uh, yeah, so, so, I've, so what I've proven so far that if the S matrix is integrable, it has to take this form. So the inverse statement is also true. I mean, I'm not, I won't spend time uh, proving it, but it turns out that, uh, that yes, this, this integrable S matrix is, does have the all necessary unlinearly realized uh, Nonlinearly realized Lorentz symmetries, as long as this one loop 
annihilation part is cancelled. As long as the particle content is correct to cancel the, just the leading uh, non-integrability thing. Okay. Uh, so now the, the comment is that since they all have this uh, simple form analogous to that in the, uh, in the fundamental string theory, so it begs for some uh, manifestly normalizable simple description, right? So if I were talking about linear dilaton, uh, of course I could just introduce Polyakov's metric. So this H, it's not induced, it's just a Polyakov metric. And this thing becomes manifestly normalizable because R is just the operator of dimension two. So this thing is conformal, there is no anomaly as long as the background charge is correct. That's all nice. The problem is that I do not know how to do it for all my other theories. Because I do not know how to, if, if I try to do this in Polyakov language, I don't gain anything because these guys, I still, they are not uh, uh, simple renormalizable operators. So my, my action stays as complicated as it was in, in my initial static gauge. So, uh, so anyway, that, that's, that's something that would be nice to figure out, but I didn't make any, any progress. Uh, okay, so, so Okay, so now that the question, so I showed that if we still want to make our thing integrable, we need to have this new masses particles on the world sheet. Uh, and one way, one way to do it is to have uh, supersymmetry. And supersymmetry, if you break spontaneous supersymmetry, you get some Galstinas. Uh, but, but the point is that, the, again, in four dimensions, this doesn't help you. It, it, it could only help you if you are in 10 dimension, and then you would just get the uh, Green Schwartz superstring. Uh, and, and, and generally it is because Goldstone theorem for compact groups doesn't work. So it's, it is in general hard to produce massless particles in, in, in two dimensions. However, maybe in the larger limit, I mean, uh, if we take n to infinity, whereas in the bulk the, the theory has some, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially a free theory in the bulk, so it has some huge symmetry groups. So, 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 so maybe something, in, some miracle like this can happen. Uh, and uh, for, for pure, I mean, the only, I, I don't have any first principle way to, uh, to tell you whether it happens or not, but that's something we can, uh, uh, we can learn from lattice calculation. Uh, uh, so there is this group of people uh, that, uh, that do really remarkable lattice measurements of the spectrum of flux tubes. Uh, in pure Young Mills theory, okay, uh, and at least for SQ3, uh, as it's been all known for a while that there are no exactly massless particles, uh, because just from measurement of the ground state energy, I mean, all massless particles would contribute to ground state energy uh, to this power law term, and th this correction has been measured with very good precision. That it's really d minus two. That it's just the goldstones that li that, that live there. Okay. Uh, however, an interesting point uh, is that recently uh, it, uh, it, it was understood that, th there is a, that there is a massive particle that lives on the roll sheet of QCD flux tubes uh, in, 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 in four dimensions. Okay, and uh, this, this particle is a pseudoscalar. Uh, and as, uh, as you understand, in, in, in four dimensions, the pseudoscalar with respect to, you know, SO2 is just, is the same as anti-symmetric form. Uh, so, and, and that was the only, so that's the only massive excitation that's seen on the roll sheet of the string and, and there is some, we know that all other excitations should be at least a few times heavier. So if anything, if, if QCD flux tube is close to any integrable theory, then it should be close to my uh, member of the family of my theories that had the anti-symmetric form field. Okay, no, just in, 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 in four dimensions, they're just uh, pseudoscalar. Okay. Uh, so the mass of this pseudoscalar particle that we extracted using the, this, uh, the using approximate integrability and uh, the TBA techniques, uh, and and so what it happened to be, it's, so it's something for SU3, it's something a bit smaller for SU5. So at some point we thought, okay, maybe it will just go to zero for n to infinity, and then we're essentially done. Uh, 
but uh, then the the lattice people they they measured the mass all the way up to SU12, and and it did not go to zero, of course. So it goes a little bit down, but it but it stabilizes. And I should I should thank uh, Andreas and Mike for sharing this unpublished results with me. Okay, so so what can we do? Okay. So we can still ask questions about the coupling. So you remember for, for cancellation uh, of the anomaly, there were two conditions. So mass had to be zero, but also the coupling had to be some fixed value. OK? Uh, and coupling, that's also something we can extract from the lattice. Uh, and I just remind you that, OK, the theory that I study now, that just, OK, this is the, the, the original part, the universal part of the QCD string, which is the uh, area. And then I'm adding this A, the pseudoscalar particle, which has some mass. Uh, and it, it couples to this, uh, to this geometric invariant with some Q. So now I'm extracting this Q. And the critical value of Q for integrable theory, you know, at m going to 0, that was this thing, uh, 0.37. Uh, and the value that is measured from the lattice, uh, it's, it's 0.38. And yeah, the, the, fu the, funny thing, the funny story about how this project actually got started is that I just, for fun, I, uh, I calculated what is kind of our, just the central value that's coming from the lattice uh, and compared it with this thing. And they agreed up to four decimal digits. So we thought, OK, that, that should be it. Uh, but then we calculated the error bars. As you saw from the previous talk, lattice is something like an experiment that doesn't give you a precise answer. It gives you answer plus some error bars. And the error bars turned out to be like 10% or so. So you can, I don't know, you can, you can think that that's just a numerical coincidence. But anyway, yeah, that's how, how the data looks like. Uh, anyway, pra practically what it means uh, is that this pseudoscalar, it cancels most of the non-integral part of the amplitude uh, w when you go to high energies, where you go to energies above the mass of this pseudoscalar. So, so with current precision, uh, it cancels this up to like 10% or something. But, but, but that's something, I mean, you can conjecture that that should be the case, and that's something that can be tested you know, if the lattice data becomes better and the error bars shrink and it keeps approximating this critical value, then may, maybe, it, maybe it's hinting us that the theory wants to become integrable again in the, in the ultraviolet. Okay? Uh, so something I want to conjecture uh, is that in the UV, the theory goes again to my integrable e to the AS, S matrix. So you may wonder, okay, why, why e to the AS? I mean, is there, is there, anything, uh, is there anything special about e to the AS? Okay, there are a few things that are quite special. So this, this e to the AS thing, it's something like a universal CDD factor. Okay, so it's a CDD factor that you can dress with uh, even an arbitrary two-dimensional theory, no matter if it's massive, massless, uh, integrable or not integrable. Uh, that's, that's something we pointed out in this paper with Sergey and Merdad. Uh, so there is, this, there is this explicit formula. It's some, for, for an S-matrix element with arbitrary number of particles, there is some exponent of some anti-symmetric product of momenta that at, at large energies, it simply reduces to the product of total left moving and total right moving momentum. Okay, and the reason why uh, the, the fundamental reason why this uh, uh, CD factor exists for arbitrary theory uh, is that it's, it's related to the deformation uh, by an irrelevant operator that's present in any two-dimensional theory, which is just a product of TT bar. Okay? And uh, uh, so as, as recent as on Monday, there were two very nice papers that, that actually studied uh, in details this deformations of quantum field theories with, uh, with TT bar. 
Uh, and also there is a poster, there was a poster on Monday um, related to, to this topic. Uh, and, and essentially it's been, I mean, it's, uh, it's been solved. Uh, essentially if you know the theory, if you know if something about your quantum field theory, you also know what happens when you deform it by TT bar. Uh, in particular for the spectrum, at least in the zero total momentum uh, sector, uh, there is a, just a very precise formula. So this if E0 is the uh, is a spectrum of your initial theory, then this, uh, the solution of this equation, it will be the spectrum of the deformed theory where alpha should be identified with my, what, what, I, what I called LS squared. Okay, and, and this spectrum you can see that again, ge generically, uh, if, you, if you took at least some theory which had a, some UV fixed point, so this spectrum will develop a Hagedorn type singularity uh, at some finite distances. I mean, I, I, it's very obvious. I mean, I, I, I hope it's self-evident that I'm taking, uh, I'm talking about theory compactified on a circle of radius r. So at some finite radius of the circle, there will be a singularity uh, in the spectrum, which is for QCD flux tube, that's what we expect because that's how the confinement phase transition happens. If you take your theory on a small enough circle, the flux tube should disappear. And okay, it's, uh, the square root tie singularity makes sense um, as far as the confinement goes. So another point is that this, this UV behavior, uh, I mean the phase shift that leads to a time delay, right? Derivative of the phase shift with respect to momentum is a time delay for scattering of particles. Uh, and this time delay, it, it has uh, the geometric meaning basically. It's, it's proportional to the energy because S is energy squared. Uh, but energy of the flux tube, it also kind of change in its length, right? So you would think that this phase shift, it just, if you take some highly excited flux tube, it just becomes very long, and that would give uh, you this, this time delay that grows with energy, right? This is something unusual because if you take uh, some ordinary quantum field theories, uh, even if they flow to some fixed, uh, some non-trivial UV fixed point, the, the time delay goes to zero, high energies. Okay, but here it's, uh, it grows with energies. So, so none of this, what I mentioned, of course, is in any sense a proof, okay, of this UV behavior. Uh, you can treat it as a conjecture. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's uh, something that, that you can make prediction and, and just test it from the lattice and, and say if this conjecture makes any sense. Uh, still, apart from, from the calculations, we also need to learn theoretically how to work with this kind of theories. So my, you know, the boldest claim that I can make is that the, say, QCD flux tube uh, is this integrable pseudo-scalar theory that was perturbed by a relevant operator that's like mass of this pseudo-scalar, okay? Well, that's some, okay, that's some minimal, uh, simplest thing that QCD flux tube can be. The problem is that I don't really know how to uh, talk about this deformations of this type of RG flows. I mean, I know how to talk about deformation of some UV fixed point with relevant operators. I mean, I can, this numerically, I can study this very efficiently. Uh, this thing is not a UV fixed point, it's some RG flow, simple, relatively simple RG flow, but still it's an RG flow that goes, never terminates. So I, I don't know how to, uh, how to talk about deforming these things uh, with relevant operators, but uh, since kind of the inverse problem essentially have been solved, we know how to perturb flows uh, with TT bar that give this thing in the UV. So maybe somehow there is also a hope to learn how to talk about this uh, deformation of this type RG flows given by TT bar in the first place. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll mention uh, what's going on in, in three dimensions. So as you remember, in, in, or you may remember at least, uh, that I said that in, uh, in, in three dimensions, uh, in principle, E to the IS could have been uh, 
a, a theory of some flux tube, okay, which means that maybe there is some confining, some 3D Lorentz invariant confining gauge theory for which the uh, world sheet, the S metric, is simply E to the IS, okay? Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the case even for large and young mills, because again, there was, um, there was a very, very recent paper by, uh, by the same people, by Mike and Andreas, where they calculated the spectrum of excited flux tube for, for all the way up to SU8. So 8 is also very large N. And okay, you don't need to understand this plot very well. What's drawn here is that there is a splitting between two different three particle states. And integrability would predict that these states are completely degenerate. So, so again, you see that, that, that it shouldn't be that simple, that there is, again, some non-integrability, at least at intermediate uh, range of energies, uh, also in three dimensions. Okay, so this, this, this brings me to, to my conclusions uh, that I basically summarize so, so, so once again, what, what, what we have seen that there is always universally just from symmetries and degrabilities at low energies, then it has to be broken unless there are massless particles at intermediate energies. Uh, if you add massless particles, we classify all possible integrable theories consistent with uh, bulk Lorentz symmetry and some wishful thinking is that uh, QCD flux tube still has something to do with one of those integrable theories, maybe at high energies, and as a mild indication, you can s maybe take this presence of relatively light uh, pseudoscalar particle with appropriate couplings. Okay, thank you for your attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I briefly, uh, well, I, I, I did not put any formulas on the slides, so uh, it may not be very helpful, but it's some, something we studied in this paper, how do you put fermions uh, on the world sheet? And well, in particular, we just studied, okay, if you have supersymmetry in the bulk, so you take some supersymmetry, n equal one, QCD, I don't know. You assume that your flux will break spontaneously some of the bulk supersymmetries. Then you have Goldstinus, right? Just two-dimensional fermions that are, have quantum numbers of broken generators. And again, you can run the whole same thing. You, you know what your action is. You know what your leading action is. Uh, the conclusion is that to leading order in four dimensions, uh, this action has to be, uh, okay, uh, if you want classical integrability, then this action has to be uh, just Green-Schwartz superstring. Okay, that's that's the point. Uh, and uh, then you know that at one loop, you will have the same anomaly unless you took 10-dimensional Green-Schwartz superstring. So now, if you're asking about just other massive, say, some massive fermions that have nothing to do with supersymmetry, just if I have fermions in the bulk, I'd probably expect uh, fermions on the world sheet. Uh, you can. It's a little bit harder to work out uh, just, just technically doing this uh, kind of cost. You, you need to do, so here I basically guessed the answer without any kind of coset constructions. Uh, if you have fermions, uh, you do need like honest kind of uh, uh, CCWZ type coset construction to write a Lagrangian. Uh, it's, it, it is some work in progress. Uh, one motivation for this uh, is that, so we have this pseudoscalar, right? 
uh, that's relatively light and uh, no one kind of, I mean, that's not what you expected, right? You probably expected some scalar, some Liouville type of mode. So, uh, we want to know what the hell this pseudo-scalar is. Uh, and one option is that uh, it could be a bound state of, of two fermions. So there is some motivation, I mean, there is something like this seen in n equals 4 in some regime. Uh, and just generally, I mean, getting a light pseudo-scalar particle is easy as a, as a bound state of two fermions. Uh, so, so that's one thing we're trying to figure out. If we replace this thing with, uh, with two fermions, uh, it will look approximately the same. Then the question, okay, does it give you a better fit to lattice data if you want? It's something you can, you can test. It's something we haven't done, but it, it, is, be, it is being done gradually. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so so first of all, I mean, we are certain that QCD does not have any Lorentz anomalies. That, that that's a four-dimensional Lorentz invariant theory, right? Uh, so that's why what kind of our approach here is that I insist. So uh, so anomaly, it's always a conflict between two symmetries, right? I mean, roughly speaking. Uh, so here. We, of course, insist on having Lorentz symmetry unbroken. And basically, where anomaly shows up, it's an anomaly in this symmetry that uh, uh, gives you integrability, if you want. So, so you, you know, integrability is related to some maybe complicated infinite dimensional symmetry. Uh, and at the three level, I can insist, I, I, I naturally have both. I have Lorentz, this nonlinear Lorentz symmetry, and whatever symmetry that gives me integrability. Then at one loop, there is an anomaly. So I can, I can pick which one I want to, to keep, OK? If you want to keep integrability, then indeed there will be a term in the action that explicitly breaks Lorentz symmetry proportional to d minus 26, OK? So I, I can write by hand a term that restores integrability that I was effectively doing by integrating out my scalars. I can say, oh, I don't have any scalars. I just write by hand the term that cancels the non-integrable piece, OK? Then this term will explicitly break Lorentz symmetry, and indeed, my, all my word identities will have kind of some kind of right hand side given, given by this term. Okay? If that answers, if that answers your question. But I, I, here I want to insist on Lorentz because I want really to study QCD. So then all the word identities are exact, but integrability gets, gets broken. Uh, there will be some short announcements, but before that, let's uh, keep going.